Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Open Source Episode 13. And I'm very excited that today we have a new guest, uh, Surya Saha. Say hi, Surya. Hello. Uh, and I'm delighted to be joined once again by both Rory Onsworth. Say hi, Rory. Or hi, everyone. Hi. Wait, no kiss today? <laughs> Thank you. And uh, with uh, Mark Simpson. Hey, hello, everybody. Excellent, excellent. So, Surya, uh, could you give us a little introduction on yourself and also tell us why did you choose to join our community? Yeah, sure. Well, firstly, thanks for the kind invitation. Glad to be here with you guys. Um, so, to start with, um, I have around, you know, I'm working in the insurance field and have a total experience of more than eight plus years now. And my area of uh, the field of focus is primarily on the commercial insurance side of it, and of course, uh, the um, how the uh, digital technologies are coming up. So the shifts is also focusing on the digital part of it, uh, pertaining to AI, IoT, and um, blockchain. So besides the professional part, um, I am also pursuing my PhD in enterprise blockchain, focused on the insurance business model on the claim side of it. And um, besides that, in February this year, um, I published uh, my first book, The Digital Choices. Excellent. So Second that, author on our show. Brilliant. <laughs> uh, that's mainly talking on the digital journey and organization should take it, starting from spotting the opportunity to the fintech, insurtech, blockchain, to how the digital workforce should look like and what a digital leader uh, you know, need in today's uh, organizations. Um, so these are the basic things, and um, apart from that, as a voluntary, pro, I mean, voluntary involvement, I am uh, part of the steering committee of the Europe India Center for Business and Industry, where I'm particularly, you know, focused on the fintech development of both the uh, regions. So how policies can be developed, businesses can be brought together across borders, and etc. Great. And the most interesting part is last year, 2019, uh, November. I was being um, voted to be um, the member of the board of the Hope Foundation, which is headquartered in Ireland, but functions in um, India. Um, so there, uh, my area where I'm particularly looking at is uh, implementation of blockchain for social transformation, particularly for fundraising and stuff. Awesome. So that's about it. And why did I join the community? It's mainly to learn gain the knowledge from each other. So I've seen your other open source sessions. So varied people from various backgrounds coming in and you know talking on their expertise. It's always good to network virtually, which is the new thing, new normal now, and learn from each other. So that's the main uh, you know, idea behind it. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And uh, am I right in understanding you're, you're based in India at the moment? Bangalore, yeah. In Bangalore. Excellent, excellent. So welcome again, you know, to our show. Um, Thank you. Rory, do you want to tell us what is it in the news that you found interesting, please? Well, Surya already mentioned uh, AI, and mine is on AI, right? And specifically the AI um, system produced by OpenAI, a company which Elon Musk uh, invested in. I mentioned that only for sort of recognition of the product, not because it's, you know, and anything influencing um, the, the quality. But, um, and by the way, just to clear this up as well, I am not related to Vernon Unsworth, the cave diver who Musk came to grips with. A <laughs> just to clarify. <laughs> anyway, the system I like this week is called GPT-3. So it's three means it's third generation. And I'm, I'm sure that there's still lots wrong with it. And uh, people are saying it's, to, it's not eco-friendly. It's got 175 billion language parameters, which is enormous. So of course it uses up electricity. And there are critics who call it the world's most sophisticated autocomplete. Okay, that's one way of looking at it. But I am an AI skeptic and in our context, and when I've looked at what this thing can do, it's pretty impressive. So you can put in varied input like text, free text, images, um, and there are lots of possible uses in insurance and reinsurance. My pet one, as you know, is the practice of law and specifically uh, 
insurance and reinsurance contracts, which is a big time consumer. And when we struggle to get our heads around what is the portfolio, what does it mean and what's its quality? I've been uh, investigating AI for many years, about four or five years in that context. And I have not been impressed by what traditional systems can do. They really only marginally reduce reading and they're heavily error prone. But when I look at what GPT-3 demos show, um, I can imagine that you could loan all your insurance reinsurance contracts into such a system and tag the clauses, um, you know, for themes, for acceptability. And you could probably use this system um, to find or create clauses or templates, match them with historical commentary and with the quality dimension too. So I'm looking for an insurance company to try this with. So please reach out if you're interested, but I think that this generation is the real game changer. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Roy. Mark, tell us about your, your background paper uh, and what are you going to talk to us about what you found interesting this week? So, so this, is, this is a link in terms of uh, arrival. So travel, that thing for most of us um, existed BC, so be, before Corona, um, <laughs> and maybe a dim and distant memory. So uh, in part, it's, it's to go back to that. But it's around share ring. Um, so the words share and ring together. And they're using blockchain um, primarily to solve self-sovereign identity and proof of insurance, proof of health simultaneously and people that know me know my phrase about I like ands rather than ors so they've got um, an enterprise ready blockchain It's built on a technology called Tendermint blockchain which I'd not heard of until this week and, it, and it's all about travel sharing on demand economies and, and what I like is as a customer it's trying to bring things together so all the necessary activities the bookings that you can get in one place so your hotel check-ins your flights your visa your tourist applications and now your COVID-19 tests you've got self-sovereign identity in terms of the identity cards you've got mobile wallets you've got payment solutions you can even link your vehicle rentals in this as well and they claim and and we've you know we've got friends of the show that are working on um, COVID solutions as well but the first anom anonymous contract contact tracing passport and it's integrated with the e-visa ar arrival systems as well with travel insurance companies with airlines hotels retail shops so the idea is with your proof of health you, you've got a qr code it's scanned by whoever needs to check and it reveals the status of your test so so that was quite interesting and and sharing as part of a bigger application they they already integrate with 2.6 million hotels Wow. And they're already disintermediating people like Uber and Airbnb. So that's really interesting as well. So, so that's, my, uh, that's my like of the week. No, thank you very much for that, Mark. Um, Surya, could you tell us what is it in the news that you found interesting this week, please? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I have been researching, um, doing a lot of uh, work um, for a couple of projects uh, regarding space explorations and how the space economy is it's you know looking towards a real growth trajectory in this decade and how things was you know 10 years back and how things are now and how things would be going forward so uh, there was an interesting um, article that's come up um, on 3rd of august um, that stock you know literally you know decoded how uh, space tourism is going to take over you know how we are actually looking beyond the way we thought a couple of years back so if we are actually trying to understand how space tourism is going to um, affect the economy affect the way we look at things affect the way we travel there's also significant you know amount of uh, interest that is you know uh, being aligned towards the insurance sector and particularly for uh, you know product lines like liability so, and if you see uh, whichever space organizations, particularly the government ones, uh, like the uh, European Space Agency, NASA, or ISRO, or anything else, so whichever uh, you know launches they make, um, it's as of now it wasn't a mandate to be insured because it's a high you know capital intensive industry. 
and it's more a public owned uh, entity that was running it. So now when we witness the more, you know, more and more we are witnessing a, the private sector and public sector partnership, how SpaceX, uh, Boeing, Blue Origin, and various others, you know, even space uh, technology startups, they are coming in. So when these are, and even Virgin Galactic, so when they're focusing on such uh, kind of a, you know, dimension, there's a huge amount of risk that is getting involved. So when, you are, when you're having a rocket to launch, so before, the initiation, you know, before you initiate the launch, the ideally uh, the insurance policy doesn't come to effect. So after the launch is when the policy comes in effect, hmm. right? So what happens when a rocket or a satellite has been launched, a space uh, craft has been launched, if any sort of an anomaly happens up in the sky beyond our, you know, we cannot see that. So how do you actually measure the risk there? The, the, the people in there, when you're, when you're trying to, un like a couple of months back, this uh, Elon Musk did a massive you know, uh, thing that he has actually taken and taken to, to human towards to the space, uh, International Space Station. So you're actually carrying living beings there. So it's a huge amount of liability that you're also carrying along. So when you want to risk, I mean, when you want to ensure such risk, if any sort of an anomaly happens up there, how do you measure it? You cannot literally physically travel and check what is the amount of loss that has happened, right? It's not possible. Eventually, it'll take months to understand what is it, but you cannot. So if when we talk about insure tech technology, right, the amalgamation of insurance and technology, so to, to have blockchain in it, to understand, you know, the uh, spacecraft has taken has taken up, I mean, taken over, it's being launched, it's flying, it's going around the orbit, lower orbit, upper orbit, whichever it is, and there's something happens. So you have a real-time information passing through, but there's a challenge there. How do you get a real-time information passing through from space, right? You need internet over there. How do you have internet in space? Now, of course, there's a solution to it. Elon Musk is planning a big project on that. He plans to launch around 1,000 satellites around the planet just to provide internet in space. <laughs> so now if you provide internet in space, there's an issue of latency. For that also there's a solution on how exactly the latency, what is the measurement of the distance you're trying to uh, you know, cover. If it, if it just you know, kind of a blockchain technology uh, uh, or some sort of a sensors fixed on your, in a rocket to understand if anything happens, you get real-time data. But what happens when you're trying to send a rover to Mars? Will a latency, how much, you know, affect that distance? How long will it take? It, perhaps it may take a year to actually make a computer transaction. So these are the things we don't know. There is no cases, you know, a verified case on that. But people, I mean, are researching, we are researching, we're exploring that. And there's another dynamics to it. Now, various countries like China, United States, and Japan, you know, we are trying to, they're trying to look beyond something which, you know, as a common man, we might not think about at right this point of time, that is by 2040 in Earth, the resources we have will get exhausted. How do we counter that? So you have, you need an alternative source of resources coming in. So there's the concept which we are talking about now is asteroid mining. So if you have to mine an asteroid and get indefinite, infinite amount of resources, because an asteroid contains water, platinum, gold, iron, but you just have to understand which asteroid contains what and what volume, because there are three types of asteroid. So understanding those asteroids, transmitting the information from space to Earth, which one is good, then you mine there, and no one owns any space resources, right? So there's no legal boundary to it. So coming up on that, a legal uh, you know, regulations, and when you mine it, who is going to be the owner, how you transact. Over there, of course, you cannot transact debit card, credit card, or maybe you know, PayPal, or uh, anything else. Fiat currency, of course, no. So only option comes to your digital currency, it's Bitcoin or Ethereum, whatever. So if you have to 
have such transaction, even for you know ensuring a loss, you need a proper background or infrastructure to it, which is nothing but can be you know uh, made uh, use of through blockchain. So these are the kind of researches which I have came across, particularly this week after the news uh, on third of August. This is something very interesting, and you know, I think some of the other way we should all start learning a bit here and there and see where it goes. Great. No, thank you for that. It's interesting. So I actually spoke with uh, David uh, Schreier from the Oxford and MIT Futurist program about this exact point about asteroid mining and how we could use blockchain you know, from a provenance standpoint and the allocation of those resources. So th thank you for that. Uh, Rory, back to you. Could you tell us what is it in the news that made you wonder? Well, um, I, after that, uh, that bit, I'm wondering and rather hoping that I'm the first person ever to spend a Bitcoin in space. That would be great. <laughs> I think we should launch AstroCoin between the four of us. I think it's got something. My bucket list <laughs> just got bigger. <laughs> Anyway, mine is uh, around big tech uh, moving into health and the impact on insurers. And normally, Mark, apologies, this is your area of expertise, but something got me wondering this week uh, on Tuesday, in fact, when the EU launched its antitrust investigation into Google's purchase of Fitbit last November. So you'll probably all remember that. Anyway, that purchase was always taken seriously by insurers because if big tech are allowed to, to track and to keep our health data, they could disrupt the incumbents, right? Yeah. And Fitbit and Google is a pretty good combination to do just, just that, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. in, so in Europe, public and private health spending is currently considerably lower than in the US. So, so what I've got here, right, is, is the, um, in, in um, there's a health spending in Europe with only 10% being uh, of GDP being spent on health. This is in America, right, where it's 17%. And this slide allows you to see the difference between the two. So you see the 17 versus the 10. So basically what, what the salespeople are seeing, and probably rightly, is, is room for growth, right, particularly in Europe. And they're not wrong. Mm. Um, the last of the baby boomers are going to retire in the next 10 years. And there could be a huge uptick in health spending in Europe. And if, if it's Google that continues to own this data generator and to provide people with data about their own, you know, state of health, heart rates, blood pressures, all that kind of stuff, their status as a data processor, I'm, I'm, I'm sta stating the obvious here, right? But their status as data processor will be more and more important and they could become the biggest broker in health. Mm. If you think about it in practical terms, they can suggest to you a doctor, a medicine, an insurer, and they can direct health subjects to provide them who pay big tech the most, right? Or not, if the EU doesn't like this idea. So I wonder what the EU will do here. It's, a, it's quite an important one. It'd be interesting to see, you know, if that judgment, it will, if what impact that we could have also is Apple, was their Apple Health program. Mm -hmm. I know there's no acquisitions involved, but um, I remember Google saying how they were not going to access the data from Fitbit, which was odd, but uh, I don't see how they're going to resist that kind of uh, money right. making opportunity. Uh, Mark, are we under surveillance? Well, it's, it's another link, really. Uh, and, and again, it's, it's on a national level. So um, I want to talk about the UAE, so the United Arab Emirates, and they've implemented a countrywide blockchain-based ecosystem for data sharing. So I was just picking something on the security. Um, um, and I guess by, by background, we all know that we've got too much friction in the insurance industry. We've got duplicated processes. We've got inefficient processes. It's quite painful. So this week, the announcement from the UAE about their partnership with the Swedish blockchain KYC company uh, called Norblock um, really interested me and made me wonder. So it, it's, they became the first country to implement a countrywide blockchain-based ecosystem for data sharing. So they involve um, people like the Dubai Economy, the Banking Group, Emirates, MBD, um, and they've got this KYC blockchain platform. So it's around secure digital customer onboarding. You've got instant bank account functionality and sharing of the verified KYC data between the different licensing authorities, between financial institutions, and blockchain enables and underpins that. 
and the idea is as a company you can choose to share your data in real time with whatever financial institutions you choose and it helps reduce the time for you and for them in terms of that onboarding and it's really part of this what um, the Dubai uh, model calls agenda number one so how do we improve customer experience um, the UAE government has, a, has had a long vision around digitization and, and leading the world in that and being paperless and it's supported by an, another um, initiative with Smart Dubai, the central bank of the UAE. So they're the regulator that's playing a role in this. And they've already got a lot of participants, a lot of companies. So it made me wonder if a state can put its resource like this, I wonder if and how an industry like insurance could tackle this and improve the customer experience and the cost of KYC. Yeah, that's brilliant. And, and to get more context on uh, the UAE's approach to blockchain. I'll refer you guys to the podcast um, we did with Mariam al Mohari from the Dubai Future Foundation. And they've been looking at blockchain for quite a while at a Dubai level, Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi level, and also the federal UAE level. It's uh, A lot of it has to do, from what I understand, with their leaders being quite young and having an approach of, let's just try this out. And our ROI is not so much measured in in uh, dollars, but it's a measured in um, the impact it will have on their society, which, yeah. which, which is uh, very interesting. Customer um, first at a state level. I mean, uh, it, you know, so often companies say, oh, we should put the customers first like it's an afterthought. So if a nation can put the customer first as a forethought, yeah. it's brilliant. Of course, of course. And it's interesting because, you know, across the world, most of the time it's private companies who take taking initiatives. And in this case, you know, it is the, pub it is the government effectively. Uh, so thank you for that, Mark. Uh, Surya, back to you. Could you tell us what is it in the news that made you wonder this week? Yeah, so um, the interesting part, which I you know, just uh, spoke about, I think I would just link to that only. Um, so what exactly it's making me wonder is, which whatever um, the, you know, the kind of vision we are having in implementing a blockchain technology to, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, manage the risk out there in the space and how we ensure such, you know, for example, write such policies and the effect on the writers and the insurers. So how exactly in the future we are trying to uh, achieve that? It's, it's going to be a huge milestone. It's a huge capital that's involved in it. Who would be the, uh, who can be the possible partners to achieve it? So these are the kind of, you know, questions that uh, is making me wonder and think, how better we can do that. And I have a feeling that this is going to be a very collaborative approach that's going to involve a lot of people. And Surya, yes. if, you're, if you're up for the challenge, uh, I'm going to challenge you to create a group on our community platform to invite members to share their thoughts you know, on how that could be tackled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. And, and so we, we can definitely do that. I mean, I would love to get my friends. Um, I mean, we have, we, in fact, last um, Thursday, we attended a, a webinar on uh, space and blockchain technology. So we have pretty good people out there who are doing a serious research on it. So we can Brilliant. certainly get into it. Yeah. That would be awesome. Well, well also the InsureBlocks uh, Miro board uh, is missing space. So if I could turn that part of the board over to you, sir, just to add some stuff on and, and get people going, that would be fantastic. And, and just to give on our lap, yeah. we'll be making an announcement, but uh, we've, re we've quietly launched the ambassador program on, um, on the community, where basically every member now can invite new members to join in. So Syria, if you want to invite, you know, that group of individuals who are passionate about exploring you know, space exploration with blockchain and how that intersects with insurance, um, that, that will be a great opportunity. But for now, um, this is the end of this episode. So I want to thank you all very much, you know, for, for your contributions, especially to our guest, uh, Surya. Thank you uh, for being with us. And to you, uh, the viewers of this video, uh, we'd love to have you part of our community. We'd love for you to join in our open uh, episode. So feel free to add a comment below if you want to be part of this conversation. We'd love to have you with us. Thanks, everyone. Have a great end of week. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you.